All right, everybody. Welcome to our Thursday morning video stream. I'm here with uh, Pastor Matthew Noyce from Antigua, Steve Chisholm in North Little Rock. I'm Tony Hammock uh, here in Batesville, Arkansas, and uh, we're just three guys. We like to hang out. We like to talk about the Lord and uh, what God's doing. I, I believe that uh, you know we have the written record of the work of God in the Bible, and uh, I believe the Bible is a living document. And we have this uh, history of God, what God has done, what God's talking about doing, planning on doing in the future. And one of the names of God is I Am. And, uh, you know, I like, I like the I was God. I like the I will be God. But I also really love and appreciate the I Am God. Sometimes we need God to be God right now. And in, in the present... And uh, I'm excited about the, the dimensionality of God, all the ways that God does things. But uh, I really enjoy and get excited about the I am God. And uh, I think, you know, part of, the, part of the idea of the I am God is that he is uh, a king. and He's the king of the kingdom of God. And when he walked on the earth in bodily form, he manifested his kingdom everywhere he went. It's like he couldn't get away from who he was. He was in just the same way we can. You know, he, he was the king of the kingdom of God because he was the king of the kingdom. He acted like the king, you know. So if he came across something that didn't belong in his kingdom, he got rid of it. Or if he came across something that didn't just jive with him in a certain way, it, it would, it would, he would shift it. He would change it because of the supremacy of who he was and, and his title and role. So anyway, I believe that same king lives on the inside of Pastor Matthew Noyce. I believe that same king lives on the inside of his people. And so part of the purpose of the show is to help people understand that and then transition to move so we can also release the king the kingdom, you know, where you and I can walk in life and live a blessed life and in a good life, but at the same time, live a kingdom life. You know, because that's really, to me, where I found the most life satisfaction, you know, is, is being about the Father's business. You know, there's, there's a lot of things you can find satisfaction in life, but I've never, I've never come across anything as significant in, as being used by the Lord to help someone or being used by the Lord to move in the supernatural or something like that. But Pastor Matthew, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you uh, make some comments, maybe share share some thoughts that the Lord's speaking to you about. Well, once again, good morning, and Tony, thanks for having me. Good morning. Uh, You're welcome, of course. I don't, I don't want to turn around my camera and let you see this beautiful blue sky and um, turn on my, so you can feel the warmth and the cool breeze blowing through. Um, I think that would be good. <laughs> but, um... God is a king, Tony, and uh, mm -hmm. I've been looking at a passage of scripture that has encouraged me, but it also has challenged me. Um, when you said a while ago that God said, I am, um, there's a passage of scripture, I think it's, I think it's Exodus 5, I'm not sure, but it's uh, where God sends Moses down to Pharaoh. It's interesting because at the end of chapter 4, there's this huge worship celebration and woods and air and they go down and they tell the people, hey, God's going to set you free. And the Bible says the people believe the word of the Lord and they fell to the ground and they worship God. And you, you can picture this great church service, Tony. It's incredible mm -hmm. worship church service. You know, worship, extravagant, everybody on the floor worshiping God. And then you go over to chapter five, I think it is. And when you go over to chapter five, <laughs> Moses and Aaron walk up to Pharaoh and they say, hey, let God's people go. And Pharaoh looks them square in the eye and says, nah. No, not, not doing it. Not, nah. not today. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So I've been looking at that and uh, I'm thinking, Moses saying, did you hear me? I said, God said to let my people go. <laughs> and Pharaoh said, did you hear me? It's not going to happen. But what's interesting, just talking about the kingship of God in that little chapter, is that um, Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? 
that I should let them go. Fiba says, I don't know no God. You know what I mean? Who is the Lord? And um, he turns around and coming out of that discussion, he says, look, these people are too idle. Let's give them more work to do. And he turns up the pressure. And he says, yeah. man, let, let them go and find their own straw and, and everything. And um, here it is now. In chapter 4, they were worshipping. Um, the pressure came really hard on them in chapter 5. And they did what every good <laughs> Christian person does when pressure hits them. They turn on the pastor. And um, <laughs> they turn... Oh. They, uh -oh, and they turn to <laughs> Moses and they say, Moses, everything was good and dandy until you came here. Everything is um horrible now. So the uh -huh. people are hurting, they're physically being abused, their workload has gone up, things have not gotten better. On the contrary, things have gotten worse. Um, so they turn on Moses. Um and then Moses does what every good leader, every good leader does when they're under the pressure. He turns on God and he comes to God and he says, God, what's going on? Everything was good before you came into the picture. My life was good. Everything was good. And since you've come into the picture, everything, the people hate me and everything is out of whack. But when you turn over to chapter six, it is the most, such an incredible thing. So here the people are panicking. Moses is panicking. Everything is out of work. And if you read the beginning of chapter 6, God says to Pharaoh, God says to Moses, look, <laughs> paraphrasing, God would say to Moses, this is going according to plan. Because with a mighty hand, he's going to let them go. And in verse 2 of chapter 6, he says, I am the Lord. And when I read that, it's like if God is saying, look, why are you panicking? Don't you understand that it has to go like this? And God flexed his bicep and said, look, I Pharaoh just said, he don't know me. But I guarantee you, Moses, before this is over, the whole of Egypt will know who I am. I am the Lord. Right? And right. flexing his biceps there. Oh, and yeah. It's easy. Yeah, I, I, I say that to say this. With this king, this great God, his ways are not our ways. And I am guilty of sometimes the narrative and the way that I think things should go. They don't always go like that. And because I have a Hollywood mind, that have been um, molded by Hollywood, and I know well, once the movie starts, how it's going to end. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I tend to put that towards God as well. And sometimes things are going exactly how God wants them to go, but oh. because we have already scripted out in our mind how it is to play out. That's why when they get to the Red Sea, with the Red Sea in front of them and fear behind them, they start crying out, oh, God, oh, God. And God, God again is saying, don't my people understand that this is where I strategically want them to get the victory. So this great God that we serve, Tony um, and Steve, is that his ways are not our ways. You know, and I am just trying to learn more about this great God, trying not to cry out, you know, at unexpected turns and twists like Moses and the people. Every time things don't go according to my, my, my script, I'm trying to be calm and say, God, is this what you want? Am I, am I in the right place? May I look like I'm in the right place? I'm in prison innocently for, you know, um, standing up for righteousness, accused of rape. But am I in the right place? Am I where you would have me to be? So, the king is great. He's awesome. I'm blown away by his ways. I'm trying to learn them a little bit every day. But he's such an incredible God. Yeah, man. Such an incredible God. So he is Tony. He's a good God. Let me uh, let me put you on pause for just a minute. We've got Matt Smith here in the in the background. He's going to join us. I'm going to bring him in. 
and uh, Matt, what's up? Showing the biceps, huh? The heavenly biceps. Oh, man. <laughs> That's what's up. I love it. <laughs> Be still, Be Matt. Amen. Yeah, Amen. I like that scripture that says the arm of the Lord is not too short. You know. Amen. That's gonna be now. I'm gonna put put up a post on Facebook today, man. You know the bicep of God. I guess I'm gonna take a <laughs> take a screenshot. Yeah, send man. it to you. <laughs> and I'm telling you, boy. and I'm telling you, boy. Yeah. <clears throat> Merry Christmas. Merry hey, Christmas. thank you. Merry Christmas to you too. It's the eve of Christmas Eve. Yeah. <laughs> Around my house, we like to call it Merry Christmas Eve Eve. <laughs> my wife's family always says Christmas present whenever they answer the phone. It's near Christmas. Christmas present. Oh. Mm. They're talking about Jesus. Hey. <laughs> awesome. My, my, my wife and family call me the Grinch. Every Christmas, um, I, I had a Grinch on the school. I'm not much of a Christmassy, Christmassy person, so you guys can really pre and intercede for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was talking with a guy this week who was uh, connected to the Worldwide Church of God, and, and I don't know if they still call it that. It used to be called the Worldwide Church of God. It was a, kind of a Christian group started by a guy named Herbert W. Armstrong, and they're really big on the feast days of the Lord in Leviticus, from Leviticus, and so they they kind of, they don't really celebrate the, the modern day holidays because of their emphasis on the feast of the Lord, and they, they draw correlations between some of the, you know, pagan practices of our, you know, the last couple hundred years, and maybe maybe further back than that. And how it's infiltrated into our modern day holidays. And most people don't really pay much attention to that, it seems like. But anyway, this group's really into it. So we were talking about it, you know. But uh, anyway, I I still say Merry Christmas. <laughs> you know, I'm a little grinchy too, to be honest. You know, I'm not a big Christmas guy. But uh, I don't try to put out the fun, you know, for everybody. You know, I just let them do it. And I did, I did put my foot down with the elf on the shelf. I thought that was creepy. I was like, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. was two years ago, though, I think. I don't know what I did to the elf, but he, he disappeared. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny because if, if, you, if, you look, if you look at history, I mean, even all through the Bible, God used, God used what they were doing that was wrong yeah. to turn it into right. Like, like uh -huh. He even said, um, I never wanted your sacrifices. Right. The, the reason that that he had them use sacrifices because they were already using it in pagan rituals and he wanted them to use it. Um, something that they were already doing for the glory of him. So, you know, you know, I was talking to a guy about this idea and we were talking about Jonah and like Jonah. You know, a lot of people, you know, there's like, I guess people that don't dig very deep think Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh. But when you really look at the scripture, it seems like he knows exactly what, he knows the nature of God is mercy. And he knows if he goes to Nineveh and preaches and the people repent, he knows God's going to show him mercy. And he realizes that the Ninevites, in his mind, are some pretty horrible people. And he wants them to be destroyed by God. <laughs> So he's like, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm not going to do it. I want God to destroy him. I'm not going to give him a chance to repent. So he gets on the ship. You know, he heads to Tarshish, and he's going, you know, the wrong direction. We know the story. You know, the storm comes up. He's, the sailors are trying to figure out who, who, who's the guilty person. And, uh, you know, Jonah's like, well, that's me. You know, I'm, I've disobeyed my God. i just throw me in the ocean and everything will be fine for you guys. I'll just, sorry about all this. Just kill me and everything will be fine. And these guys are like, no, man, you know, they, they don't really want to throw them in the ocean. But they eventually do. The storm gets calm. You know, the story gets swallowed by a fish. But what most people don't know is that the Ninevites worshipped a fish god named Dagon. Dagon. Yeah. 
And the reason yeah, he had to be spit out was because he never would have made it to the king if he would just would have went up as a regular person. Exactly, man. That's the that's the amazing, amazing sovereignty of God. You know, that God it's like in the ancient writings, he's like, Yeah, get these guys to worship a fish god and all this and then he spits the fish spits up Jonah on the beach and in the writings of the false religion of Dagon they taught that periodically a prophet would come out of the ocean to preach a message of repentance, and they had to listen. And so had so had had Jonah like just obeyed and gone to Nineveh, you know, they might have not repented, you know, <laughs> you know? but by him actually disobeying, he he sort of walked into the perfect will of God. It's man, you talk about hard to. I can't follow all that. It's tough. I mean, not only that, if you go back to when he went on the boat. Like, God used them on the boat, too, because they were Greek. The reason they're throwing everything out under the water is they're trying to throw it to the, the God of the sea. Poseidon, yeah. And Poseidon and Thor and, and all this, right? And So they're making sacrifices to false gods. And he's like, no, wait, man, you guys, I, I, I serve the true God. You got to throw me over it. I'm the one causing this. And so then when they did, they were like, man, he does tr serve the one true God, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, you can't. Uh, it's just another example in there. And the scripture is full of them. And scripture and history is full of them. That you just sin can't outmaneuver God's grace. He, His grace and his plan just... <laughs> 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 you and and it goes back to the where you started uh i am that i am you know we serve a god who we 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 have a our understanding is this is in this realm called time that's where we exist but our god doesn't he's not confined to that realm and so <laughs> You know, he doesn't see the future and the past. He's there now. You know, mind blown. We don't have a concept of that, but that's the truth. So why should we ever fear about anything if we're his? We serve the God who is and was and is to come in our understanding, but he's there. He's He's in tomorrow. And so we should never fear for for the for for tomorrow. Um, you know, Matt was talking about he brought up a, a great point of the fact that you know his ways are so uh, the unregenerated man, his ways are higher than our ways. That's the narrative of the old testament. Far past finding out. It's because man was lost, he was unhooked from holy spirit from the spirit of life uh, he was he was unhooked from the spiritual realm through god and all all that existed there was a soul a mind you know we call it the mind will and emotion the seed of the the aversions and the desires and so on but thoughts and the mind so jesus first message was change your thoughts for the kingdom is here. The kingdom of God is here. It, it we, you know, the religious world m makes a religious statement out of that about your sin. But actually, what he said was, uh, uh, change your thoughts, and more specifically, bring your thoughts back up. In the Old Testament narrative, my ways are higher than your ways. But now Jesus was preaching. No, let's bring my thoughts are higher than your thoughts far past finding out. But Jesus is preaching. No, bring those thoughts back up and you're going to I'm going to help you do that through the kingdom. He he's saying, come back up to where to where you were meant to be. If we can get a hold of that. And then in the New Testament, it says we have the mind of Christ. He's not far past finding out now. To the to the man who is hooked back in, who's in him, uh, you know, and and we see a picture of that in the covenant of Abraham, 
you know, can I do this thing that I don't let my uh, man Abraham know? I mean, Jesus said to the disciples, I don't call you servants anymore, but I call you friends because a servant knows not, but a friend is in the know. So now we have, he's called us back up to be seated with him in heavenly places. Um, and uh, we should not be content with uh, any longer in any realm, any facet groping in the darkness. The darkness is enmity with God. He is the light and the light of the, that light is in us. And because that light is in us, we become the light. And so uh, it's just, uh, you know, we have, we serve the God who said, I am. And when Jesus said that, when they came after him in the garden, what happened? Knocked him out. <laughs> they leveled him, man. They leveled him. He, he they got slain in the spirit. <laughs> Just like he manipulated the whole thing with, uh, you were talking about uh, Jonah. Jesus was manipulating everything that was happening. When they came to arrest him, he told Satan, he said, now that I'm calling this shot, yeah. you, what you must do, you do it quickly. Yeah. Uh, Jesus told Pilate, you, you, you would have no power unless it's given to you from above. In other words, I'm calling these shots and my purposes will be done. How can we, how we should never fear when we serve a God like that. You can't, the world and its devices and sin and the enemy cannot outmaneuver God. <laughs> he is way ahead of it because he is not restricted to this thing called time. He, oh, I am. I have a. Uh, can I even Pontius Pilate wrote that? Can I? Can I talk with you? Yeah. Hey. Uh, so wait, can I? Can I talk with you? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, Um, that story with Jonah, I have, I, I have ministered on it and I have said, I've used it for an example sometimes in counseling where I, I tell people, um, Jonah went to town obedience, um, <laughs> completely in the opposite direction on the map from where God called him to go. But yet, through his um, disobedience, the uh, men on the boat cried out, and the Bible says said that they declared that the God, um, Jonah's God, was the one and true living God. So we see that um, if you were to put it in our context, you know, just putting it simply, well, everybody on the boat became believers. Everybody surrendered their life to Jesus. Well, not what not yeah, we got. So I've used that example in counseling and said to people that um, not because there's a good outcome means that you are in the will of God. But we know for certain that Jonah was outside the will of God. So sometimes there is the mentality, well, um, like I know a guy that took a whole bunch of young kids, young, young believers, and he carried them to a brothel. them up and he carried them to a brothel. And um, I think that was a horrid thing he did. It was really, really, <laughs> I want to share my full feelings on that. Um, but... Um, I'm thinking, you know, if they had gone down there and uh, a lady or someone had given their life to the Lord, sometimes if I, um, something good that comes out of a bad decision and they try to justify the bad decision, yeah, it had to be good. Um, don't you see that, um, you know, everybody in the boat got saved, you know? But the, the Bible is clear that Jonah was in disobedience to God. Um it shows off the power of God. It shows off the bicep of God. But sometimes I've met some believers who go their own way. God intervenes. Something good comes out of it. Um, 
like Samson, you know, something good comes out of it. But realistically, it's it's disobedience and rebellion and God, because of his bias, steps in, accomplishes his purpose. But we can say, well, hey, whatever we do, God's just going to, um, we were in the will of God because something good happened. I don't know what you think about that. <laughs> Matt, would you like to try to answer that? I was, I was, I was, uh, <laughs> I, I like how he said that they try to justify their bad thing because God turned it to good. Uh, that's, uh, I've seen that a lot. Um, but yeah. Well, I'm still, I'm still chewing on it. Well, let me, let me throw out this thought when Steve, Steve made a comment earlier that said, you know, this, your sin cannot outmaneuver God's grace. Right. And uh, I, I thought I immediately thought about King Saul, you know, and what and how his life and the things that he did and his outcomes. Um, it 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 seems like King Saul ate ate the fruit of his sin. I mean, he he really, I mean, it messed him up. You know, it it wasn't like King Saul just, you know, everything was hunky-dory, you know, with his life, and God just turned everything around for that guy. I mean, he continued to just go downhill. I mean, the, the prophet comes to him and says, you're losing the kingdom, man. There's a guy better than you. <laughs> There's a guy out here better than you, and I'm giving it to him. I mean, if you're Saul, that's not good. I mean, that doesn't, that's not good news. You know, it's very difficult. And, and I think sometimes, you know, it does seem that people, like, uh, are destroyed because of their sin. You know, their, their destiny gets messed up. Things happen. There's, I mean, sin is destructive. I just saw a guy on Facebook. He just died. You know, I, I don't remember the man. Uh, he's young. Uh, he, uh, uh, he, I, I don't know how he died, if it was an accident or, or what happened, but uh, I had a feeling it wasn't an accident, and I could be wrong about that, but, I mean, sin, sin kills, man, you know, and uh, I, you know, I was a teen challenge, st- huh? Wages of death. Yeah, right, the wages of sin is death, yeah, Romans 6, uh, 23, I think. The gift of God is eternal life, but the wages of sin is death, and, uh, you know, I, I'd love to think that God would just somehow transform sinful situations into good all the time. But it doesn't seem like he does all the time. I mean, I, I had a, a guy I worked out with at Teen Challenge when I was in my 20s. You know, I was on staff there, and we were, they had this really uh, Spartan kind of weight room. I mean, it was raw, man. It was just like a bent bar, and... I mean, there was daylight coming through the walls and holes in the walls, and we kind of tried to fix it up and paint it. And anyway, I was working out with this guy, and if you guys have ever done any weightlifting, you you kind of it's nice if you can be about the same strength as your weightlifting partner because you don't have to strip off the weights all the time. <laughs> so anyway, this guy and I we were about the same strength, so we just kind of bonded in the weight room. And uh, that's why he, Matt and I don't never work out together. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, is Matt is Matt too strong for you? Yeah, yeah. He's got the uh, strong arm of the Lord right there. That's right. But anyway, he he graduated. You know, uh, he completed the program. He went home and got killed. He got murdered in a drug deal that went bad. You know, so you know the idea that God's just going to turn a you know just there's no consequences for sin. That's just not true to me. I mean, you guys may see it differently, but... You know, I don't see it here, but I, I would like to interject this right here. Uh, the, the guy you're talking about, he had chances. Like, oh, he like, did. He sure chances, did. Gave yep. him chances. And yet he went back to fishing instead of fishing for men. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? So, so yep. and not only that, when he went back to fishing, he took others with him. But you, you look at Peter, right? 
So in my opinion, maybe the guy was questioning his love for God or God's love for him. And so he went back. If you look at Peter, you know, he denied him. Jesus didn't ask him, do you love me, Peter? Because Jesus didn't think he loved him. Jesus knew Peter in Peter's mind. Peter didn't think he loved him. So he asked him three times, right? Like, do you love me? Do you love me? And then Peter finally got it. Man, I do. And he broke down, right? So, I mean, I believe the, the young man had chances. And, um, man, the biggest thing of addiction is uh, the biggest root cause is self-esteem. You know, not seeing yourself who God sees you as, not seeing yourself through the eyes that others have for you. And, um, but when, when Matt was talking about, uh, you know, uh, I, I immediately thought of the prophet on the, on the donkey and he kept trying to get the donkey to go the wrong way. Come on, man. Yeah, he did. He's whipping it, getting off, kicking it. And then the donkey spoke to him. <laughs> yep. Sometimes we need an ass to speak to us. So we can get the right way. I like the fact that he talks back to the donkey like it's just normal. <laughs> he just he just having a conversation with his donkey like I do this every day. <laughs> hey, but Tony, that's that's a perfect example of the spiritual stupor that we find ourselves in from sin. That's the thing. Sin doesn't change God or even His attitude about us. Jesus. Uh, the things that we're talking about where these people slipped away and then were killed and so on and so forth, that's not God's judgment on them. We're in, we're in this thing called grace right now. That's, that's the devouring enemy that's out there that's relentlessly trying to destroy, steal, kill, and destroy. That's the thing that Jesus warned about, that God warned about. I mean, God's God's nature is holy, but His heart is for His heart is mercy. He doesn't willfully choose say, "Well, I'll just I'll fix you." You know, if you want to go do that, you know that's you know I'll just uh, blast you. You know, that's not that's not God. Um, his because He is holy. When sin comes into the presence of a holy God, it is automatically, immediately judged. And that's the thing, even back with Sodom, which I think is a perfect example of God's mercy and his desire for man to not be destroyed. It says the thing that it, it's compelling that the scripture says there, it says the sins of Sodom had come up before the Lord. So we're getting to critical mass. And God saw that it was about to happen because it can't go unjudged in the, in the presence of a holy God. It's, it's dealt with. So he set about and he sought out his covenant man, Abraham. And he said, can this, can, can I do anything that I don't, you know, reveal it to my man, my covenant man. And that, and that was the purpose. And, and he allowed Abraham to, to try to strike uh, some type of deal in, in his mercy. He was willing. God was willing. God was willing in his mercy. Abraham, for your sake, yes, if there's 50, for your sake, for the sake of that covenant, yes, if that was a purpose. That was the reason God cut covenant is so that there would be some type of a scapegoat. But, and then ultimately Jesus became that. And now the, 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 the things that we see, the tragedies that we see uh, on mankind at this moment, it's not the judgment of God. His judgment was taken out 100% on his son, Jesus. In, a, in place of mankind, the only sin that we're going we're gonna to be judged for is rejecting that propitiation, rejecting that sacrifice of Jesus. 
uh, not the sins in particular, but what we're seeing now is is the is the vicious devourer that is our enemy in this world system that will absolutely destroy you. Jesus said, though, I have come that you might have life. He is the lifeline. He's the lifeline. He said, he that believes and receives my works as his own, they shall be his works by their faith. He that believeth the works that I do, shall he do also. Um, and and it, what it literally looks like in the, in the Greek is those works that I do, because of his faith, his belief, they become his works. And that's where we are. And, and if anybody's listening there, God's not trying to slap you. He doesn't get any pleasure out of, of uh, tragedies and things like that. And I just felt it was necessary to say that. God, that's not the God we serve. He put out a lifeline, and his name was Jesus. Yeah, I don't, I don't, think, um, I don't think any of us were, were kind of looking at that. No, no. I, I, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't uh, saying that. Just, when, when we're disobedient, we pull ourselves out of position to receive yes. the mercy of God. Yes. We um, get out from under that umbrella. And that's why he chases us down to keep. That's Look, right. you have me, you have me, you have me. And so, yeah. Yeah, let me just say, I wasn't uh, implying that anyone had said anything to, to indicate that that was the way God was. But I know people can misunderstand that a lot of times. So, um, mercy triumphs over judgment. So, to me, that means his judgment can I, is can mercy. I, can I do yeah. it? Come on, man, bring it. <laughs> <Come> <laughs> I want to, um, uh, uh, can we dish out, Tony? Can I disagree? Or do we have to always agree? You tell me. No, nah, you can disagree. That's oh, we all have the power to I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one of my favorite verses, or one of the, one of the verses in the Bible that has, um, has challenged me is Psalm 100. One verse one, the psalmist of thy joy of thy mercies, O Lord. Um, there we see the um the psalmist there declaring that God, I want to declare who you are, both your judgment and both your mercy. From my study of scripture, I have seen God both old and new testament um lamb. I have seen that God, my heart's desire when presenting God is to try to present him for who he is throughout scripture. Um, God is a God of mercy, but he's also a consuming fire. He's a God, I'm thinking about, like Jesus said, hey, um, better for a man that a millstone be tied around his neck and he... Um, be thrown in the, the deepest part of the ocean, then he offend the least of my children. Um, I actually did a sermon a few months here of God, and um, just from Old and New Testament, because one of the things, in my humble opinion, that is not being declared much from the pulpit is the fear of God. And I can go New Testament, a thousand and one scriptures, but there is is an element of God that I should be where he's almost a Santa Claus. He's even in his long suffering, it comes to an end. So I'm just challenged and I, I, I keep asking God, one of my prayers is I want to represent you well. And I, I'm like the psalmist, I want, I want to sing of thy judgment and I want to sing of thy mercy because what I have seen is that the church in my I think that um extremes like Red Bull and these companies um that do extreme sports they have nothing on the church the church is the most extreme I've ever seen 
in that we either go extremely hard one way or extremely hard the other way. So it depends on who you talk to. It's either God is a fire and brim stone gonna strike you down because it's morning, or on the other hand, he's um the tooth fairy and he just he just takes like this to make you happy. Somehow the Bible says a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Most topics in Christianity nice harmony to represent God. It's either one way very hard or one way other hard or other way. So my heart is that I want to represent God for who he is. Um, a consuming fire. He is all forgive mercy, which one of us who here could be on this program today. But he is, was it Abraham that said, I remember who said it, um, will not, or the David, will not the judge of all the earth do the right thing? Um, <laughs> Paul said about the coppersmith, Alexander the coppersmith. You know, we talk about David praying prayers to destroy his enemy, but the Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy said, Hey, that dude is evil, he hindered me. And, and you be careful of him, Timothy. I'm praying that God deal with him based upon what he's done for me. So I don't know if you guys pray those kind of prayers anymore, but um that's my two cents. I pray that they receive godly sorrow because that leads them to repentance. Because it, I, I've, I've had people say, hey, will you pray with me? This person did this. And then they start cursing the person. And I'm like, well, I, I can't, I can't agree with you on that. Prayer. <laughs> God smite them. They did this to me. I'm like, um, let's die to that and say, God, Bless him with godly sorrow and the gift of repentance that will lead him to you. Man. Can, can I just make one brief uh, remark? I, don't uh, misunderstand. Explain, explain the word brief. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> don't, uh, don't misunderstand. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. No, no, that's all right. Don't, <laughs> don't, hey. It's pick on Steve Hour. Don't misunderstand me. Um, God is a is a God, a holy God, as I said, and his nature it is holy. So anytime sin in any form comes into his presence, it is judged. It's not an act of his volition. It's a he that is a, his state of being. He is a holy God. But his heart toward mankind is for mercy and love. Here's what we have to decide. A lot of those scriptures that were referenced, our Old Testament, is before the, the cross. And what we have to know is this. This is the central theme. And we have to answer this question in, as far as our personal belief. Was God's holiness and his judgment satisfied 100%? by what Jesus did on the cross. If we believe that it was, yes, satisfied by Jesus' sacrifice, then we have to know that these things, tragedies and things that happen, and many of it is because people are involved in sin. Sin leads to death. It's just, it's the devourer. The, 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 we have an enemy that's looking to destroy us. Um, that's not an act of God's judgment. His judgment was satisfied with the cross and with what Jesus did on the cross 100%. That's the foundation of our, our, our salvation. We, we must believe that, that he 100% satisfied it. And also, I want to say this, just because someone says something in the scripture doesn't mean they had a total understanding at that time uh, of that particular thing we we have is, to, it takes away and and just because we have to we also have to uh we have to realize that um now i lost my <laughs> train of thought there well, well let can i jump in steve yeah, for a second sure go ahead and i'll get i'll 
I would yeah, I've done a, I've I've done a little reading, and and there's this idea of uh, in certain uninspired the inspired record of uninspired utterings. You know, occasionally you'll have people that say things in the Bible that isn't necessarily what God is feeling or saying, yeah. but it's the record of what they said is inspired. Like you, yes. like when yes. you look in the Book of Job, you know, you see these friends. They do they do a lot of talking. Just because those guys are talking in the Book of Job doesn't mean that they got it right. <laughs> right. You know, but the record of what they're saying is inspired. It's the continuing thread of truth that we're looking for. Consistency in 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 premise and in principle. Well, somebody, somebody, uh, we're going to bring in two guests to the program. Uh, they're a husband and wife team. Their names are Ananias and Sapphira. I'd like you guys to uh, that was discuss <laughs> discuss Ananias and Sapphira for our audience. I uh, let me start off by you reading my mind. Totally, I'm here thinking about Ananias and Sapphira. Let let me just, I'm going to throw this out there and then I want to hear what y'all have to say. Let me say this. Um, just, just because God reveals, gives a person a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom about something that's going to happen does not mean he is going to make it happen. That's right. It means he's trying, usually it's a warning about something that's coming because see god recognizes that there's a recognizes that there's a devourer he's the only one that's all-knowing so if he warns us hey look if you continue this course of action there's one that's laying in wait for you and he's he's there to devour you don't let's don't assume that god is the devourer he's not the devourer he tried to, to uh, give a warning, and I believe personally, because it, it, it leaves consistency in the scripture with where we are in Christ, that that's what was happening with Ananias and Sapphira. I think because there's sin, things that, that I think sin lies at the door uh, whenever, we, and, and whenever we choose a particular course of action. And God will try to warn us to save us. But it doesn't mean he's bringing that judgment. It means he's trying to keep us from that judgment. Anyway. All right. I got two things. And uh, then I'm going to have to go. I love this, by the way. <laughs> um, the, the first thing is, like you said, Jesus' judgment on the cross was enough. Right? Complete. Okay. It's complete. So is the blood. He said, I died once and for all, right? Okay, so so is the blood. It's for everybody, right? But it has to be appropriated. Right. Right? Okay, so, so we have to appropriate that. Right? Right. It, okay, so the other thing, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, right? Um. There's only one sin in the Bible, right? That is um, blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Yeah, blaspheming the Holy Ghost. There's, there's only one sin that is um, unforgivable. It's blaspheming the Holy Holy Ghost, right? So the word blaspheme means to lie. It, it, that's all it means. It's a lie, right? When they, when they said you're a blasphemer to Jesus because he said he was the Son of God, what they're saying is you're lying. Right, mm -hmm. you're you're, lying. you're a blasphemer. You're blasphemy. So the word blasphemy just means to lie. And when um, when Peter told him, "Hey, you're not lying to me. You're lying to the Holy Spirit." And because of that, right? So <clears throat> my take on that is just that right there. They blasphemed the Holy Spirit. He he told him that um, we gave all our money. And Peter's like, look, you're not lying to me. And I believe in that moment, there was a time of repentance. Right? Because Peter didn't know it. He had a word of knowledge. He revealed it to him to give him a chance to say, hey, you know what? You're right. I, I repent. 
I shouldn't have lied to the Holy Spirit and fall on his knees and please forgive me. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, anyways, what do you think, Matt? You're, you're chewing on that one, bro. Come on, brother. Jump in the pool. <laughs> I, um, uh, I like it. I like. I feel like I'm in the bullpen today, Tony. I, this is like the bullpen edition in the year. Um, show, man. I'm, really, I'm, I'm loving this, man. The Bible declares. The Bible declares that iron sharpens iron, and what I always say, iron sharpens Amen. iron, even if sparks fly. In order for iron to sharpen iron, I like it. Some that, right? I love that. Um, it, it's interesting. I just finished um, on confession. Um, been, maybe five weeks now I've been teaching on confession. And uh, I've se- I'm, I'm noticing a trend throughout scripture where God, confession equals mercy. Wherever you confess, whether it be a court of law, whether in, in every aspect, confession is what opens the door to receive mercy. Um, so let me give you so with, with reference to Ananias and Sapphira trend I see a trend throughout scripture as Steve spoke about because I love patterns I love to look for um, trends that uh, really show God's heart who he is Old Testament New Testament continuity so here it is if you study um, God comes God, when God asks a question, it's not because he wants to know the answer. He's not a police detective asking questions because he needs to know. But which he is the great I am, he knows it all. So whenever God asks a question, it's not because he wants us to know. There are other things that he wants to happen. God is looking for a confession. God is looking I had a situation with, with, with my daughter once where on her internet and she went on some you know watched something and I said to her you know what were you doing and she said well I was doing my homework and I knew she wasn't doing her homework and I asked her again what what were you doing and she said dad I was doing my homework and I knew she wasn't God when God came to Adam in the garden and God says, hey, what are you doing? Um, no, where are you, Adam? What have you done? Have you? It's not because God didn't want to know. He knew exactly what. Right. He comes to Cain and he says to Cain, um, you know, why is your countenance wrought? Um, where is your brother? Not because God didn't know. God saw the blood was crying up to him. The Bible says that if we if we believe uh, if we, Romans ten if we, if we can confess our mouth, we believe in our heart and confess in our mouth. Um, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to cleanse us, um, to forgive us and cleanse of all unrighteousness. If you look at Ananias and Sapphira, when the wife comes, the wife comes, Sapphira comes, and um. He says to her, you know, how much did you sell that property for? I, 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 I see a trend where God gives story with Elisha and Gehazi, where Gehazi goes and gets the Babylonian garment and he comes back to Elisha. And Elisha says to him, where did you go? Or where are you coming from? Are you coming from Walmart? Where are you coming from? And he says, um, I didn't go anywhere. I didn't go anywhere. I see, I see opportunities where God, by his spirit, is looking for a confession that he can give out mercy. I wonder what the outcome would have been if Adam would have run out the bush and said, God, I'm so sorry. The outcome would be if Cain would have said, um, I'm, I'm, I'm upset with my brother and I'm vexed with you. Why didn't you take my... I wonder how different the story would have been in many of these cases if genuine confessions were made. You look at this, um, how much did you sell the land for? We like 
lied, we lied, we lied. It didn't happen. Um, Gehazi, where did you go? And he said, did not my spirit go with you? Is now the time to be wearing garments and that uh, leprosy that came off of him is going to fall on you? I see that God's grace extends to us. He says in um, the book of Ezekiel that he is not willing. Um, he takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his will. He is turning but he brings opportunities for us to cry out, to repent, to turn, to change our thing, as Steve said. But a lot of times, man does not. Man refuses the grace of God. And if you refuse the grace, have left to receive is the judgment. Like I said, I got to work on I believe they gave in and can, can I put bring someone else to the discussion here? Sure. First, I, I want to preface this by saying that, you know, how many times I'll be the first to raise my hand that even in my dealings with Holy Spirit that I've lied about my true intentions, knowing who I was talking to, and I'm talking about personal relationship. And in his loving way, he... He wooed me and he brought me to a place of repentance to that. Um, and we see another in the, in the interest of contextual consistency here. Uh, if we go to 1 Corinthians 5. There was another situation in the church where a man was, uh, I believe, is what Paul is addressing, the church at Corinth. Or a man's living in, in uh, sexual sin with his mother, I think it is. But he talks about the the way to deal with this. Now they they went to him about his sin, and still he deceived himself and remained in there, and in essence lied. They took witnesses. Why would you need to take witnesses unless he was even denying? that this was even a thing these are elders that they go these witnesses they're taking the church hierarchy in there to to confront him about the sin not having it and it goes through the steps that paul outlines and then he says here's here's what we're going to do and i think this is where we get back to the story of ananias and sapphira it was just more immediate he says what we're going to do is turn him over to who? To Satan for the destruction of his flesh, whatever that means. And so in the instant, I think it's the same thing. There's not two different things happening. Um, we lie. We lie in our intent, in our intentions all the time. And ultimately, yes, that catches up with us when we've gone beyond uh, this dispensation of grace and what it amounts to. We're going to be called to make a, 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 uh, to, can we name the name of Christ or not name the name of Christ? And when it comes down to that point, when everyone's had an opportunity to receive the truth, the gospel, then the judgment of God comes. But right now, um, Holy Spirit does everything to woo us to the truth. He'll give us warnings. He'll say, hey, man. Don't go tomorrow. Don't do this. Don't continue this line of action. It leads to destruction. And then who is who destroys the flesh? Satan, the devourer, just like Jesus said, just like the scripture proclaims, there's a thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the age that we're living in right now. The to Jesus completely satisfied everything. And I think it's wrong to believe that just because God is highlighting something pointing something out that he's the one that's causing it. Most of the time, that's not what's happening at all. And life, life abundant. Yeah. One just, hand you got life, life abundant. The other hand, you got kill, steal, destroy. Yeah. And so, so basically the same thing was happening. Are we to believe that the people, that the church hierarchy and the, 
the instance with Ananias and Sapphira, they had somehow more power of God in them than the guys that went to the man in the church and confronted him about his sin, but yet he chose to deny. It's it's not two different things happening here. The, the destroyer is Satan, and God's trying to warn us, don't go down that road. Our sin doesn't change God. It changes us. It changes us to where we can't hear from God. We can't see the kingdom of heaven anymore. It doesn't change God. His mercy is satisfied. And so um, your sin doesn't have the power to take you to hell. It's rejecting Jesus that takes you there. It's rejecting him wholesale, renouncing him, denouncing him. And so um, he just wants to warn us we can destroy our lives when we get wrapped up into that, those things. And and deny the truth so matthew eighteen thirty five, jesus told him he said just like my father in heaven will turn you over to the devourer if yep. you do not forgive yeah absolutely the tormentors yep all right well we're we're right at one hour you guys want to wrap this up I'm having fun. I, Matt, we've got to... It's been a good boat, Tony. We've got to yeah. figure out how to get him an, an, a better connection because I'm, I'm, it's really broken here. I don't know how it is there, but I can't hear everything. Yeah, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to hear Matthew Noyce's uh, audio. It's kind of skipping and hopping a little bit. I guess there's internet connectivity <laughs> components there that are challenging. But what I've heard, I I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you. I I I can see your heart. Let's you, see you, just love, you just love Jesus. Hey, the fear of God is strong in you, bro. Yeah. See, there there's a holy fear. It says the fear of the Lord is our strength. Yeah. And and that's what strengthens you. So and 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 I know that that. Being in a position you're in, Matt, you, you've been with people that 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 preach hyper grace. What people say, oh, that's hyper grace. Um, I believe all God's grace is hyper, but I, I do believe that it can be um, that it can be taken advantage of, that it, that it can be taught in a wrong way. And so, I, I just want to honor you and um, yeah. in your heart for not not allowing yourself and forgetting with God and saying, man, I, I want to represent you well. I mean, the wholeness of who you are. So right, I just man. want to say, man, your, your fear of the Lord and being in right position with him, dude, that challenges me, man. And um, it inspires me. So I just want to thank you for that. Amen. Okay. Amen. Hallelujah. Going back oh, wait, to the tree. show was a great, man. It's a great honor. I, I look forward to Thursdays. I genuinely look, look, so look forward to, to, to hear, to come, and to learn. And I'm speaking from my heart. I look forward to these Thursday morning sessions so much. It's not been one Thursday that I have not uh, come on here and learned. I've been challenged. Um, and I meditate, even coming out of some of these shows, I meditate throughout the week, you know, about what we discussed and regurgitate. So I have a Unity. Um, by this sign shall our disciples by the fact that we, we love each other and I believe that it's healthy like a husband and a wife we don't agree we don't have to agree on every single thing right. to love each other fervently That's we don't right. have to see eye to eye with every single doctrinal issue before we can learn, I'm just so grateful to be a part of the kingdom of God. And I believe an honor and a privilege. And um, yeah, we, I, I love you. I love the Lord. And I just pray that he reveals himself to us and we just love him more and we represent him well. And Amen. Just he continues the work that he's done in our life. Awful God, bicep God. going to be my hashtag for this week. God's bicep. 
Amen. Well, I, I want to say this, like, uh, I really like you guys, you know, like when I was a boy, <clears throat> when I was growing up, my mother would tell me, she says, son, I love you, but I want you to know what may be more important than that is that I actually like you. And like in, uh, in the Christian church, a lot of times we say, oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, bro. I love you, bro. I don't want to say it gets cliche, but it can get a little cliche, but I think what's also interesting, you know, sometimes we feel like we have this mandate to love, like you're ordered to love people, and you're like, oh, man, I don't like that guy, but I got to love that guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I really like you guys, you know, I like, I, I love this hour too. Um, there are many things in my life that God has blessed me with that brings me a lot of joy, and this one hour I spend with you guys is one of those things. You know, I really enjoy being with you guys. I love hearing your hearts. I love hearing you guys brag on Jesus and talk about the love of God. And I mean, there's nothing more wonderful on this earth than the love of God. I mean, there is nothing. There's nothing out there that compares. And uh, I, I love that we glorify the Lord. We try to, you know, and kind of hammered out some theology today i guess some judgment new testament judgment theology <laughs> you know whatever you want to call that today we talked about but uh <clears throat> anyway i had a good time with you guys today so i bless y'all thank you I, uh, my, yeah thank you my turn to say matt uh, i'm i appreciate again i appreciate you so much uh and you're becoming uh, uh, uh someone that i i mean uh, first of all i just respect you and and everything for your your stance and the work that you do but i'm i'm learning i love you in the lord but i'm i'm you know becoming more as i become more acquainted i'm becoming more fond of you but let me say this these two guys here that i've known for some time now and tony i guess the longest but if if these are two of the few people that i will allow to speak into my life in any circumstance because i know their heart and and to correct me if they see me in a you know i would take i would there's very few people that i could take that from but these are two of those people um and uh because i know straighten up chisel because i know their heart I know that it comes from a place of love and they're legit. They're for real. And so uh, and he, he knows we genuinely like him. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so yeah. I just wanted to, to, to join in the love fest there. I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, man. It doesn't get any better than this one. Doesn't get All right. Busy. Well, you guys have a Merry Christmas, and uh, if uh, hopefully we can catch up again next Thursday. What do you say, Matt? I said in Boxing Day. Yeah, Boxing Day. Is that Antigua? Is that? I lived, I lived in the Bahamas for a while, so I, I kind of know a little bit of, of. Oh, you guys don't celebrate Boxing Day? Pardon me. You guys don't celebrate Boxing Day? No. Oh, I never heard that, whether there be such a Boxing Day. Is it but, uh, like boxing or some other kind of box? Oh, they do box. I, 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 truthfully, I don't know the history of it, but it's a holiday that we celebrate after Christmas. And yes, they do box. They set up a boxing ring, and um, okay. it's cool. Um, people get to go into the ring. <laughs> yeah, ladies. Get the ladies and on people. Yeah, lay hands on people. Suddenly and repeatedly. <laughs> yeah, and it's good. I mean, people who have little issues, maybe a little gripe, they get in the ring, they put on two gloves. They oh, I see. Day. Yeah, they settle some I, issues, huh? Okay. Yeah. Wow. I'm gonna look it up. I'm gonna I'm gonna look up the origin of boxing day. But really, but truthfully, they 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 box. People get together and they box, and uh, it's yeah. always good. They drink, they eat some food, and they box it out. You know? <laughs> yeah, they box it out, man. <laughs> Maybe we need Boxing Day here. <laughs> that might help some people, kind of. 
come to reality on some issues. Yeah. Nothing brings you to reality like getting punched in the face. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe Peter and Ananias should have had a little Boxing Day celebration. Yeah, before. Yeah, settle some issues. Well, all right, guys, I appreciate you all. Love you guys, and have a great uh, holiday. Merry Christmas to you. We'll catch you guys Happy next week. Day, Happy this Boxing Day. Happy Boxing Day.